in the last class we discussed reading for detailed understanding we saw that we analyze patterns of organization and then we interpret what these patterns mean we move on today we are going to look at reading critically if you recall in the beginning we listed four different kinds of reading or you can also say four different purposes of reading in academic context reading for general understanding reading for specific information reading for detailed understanding we have covered all the past three and now we are going to look at reading to critique evaluate and assess it's also known as critical reading so what do we do here here we understand the author's position on an issue we try to decipher ideology or the background of author and then author's attitude towards the issue this may be positive negative or neutral when we analyze a text we will look at this in detail look at the ways a particular topic has been dealt with and what alternatives exist recall many times there are multiple perspectives multiple theories are available to deal with the same topic so if the author has made a choice has chosen a particular framework we ask why this particular framework and why not the others so by choosing something and by leaving something does it significantly affect the credibility of the text so these are some kind of questions we ask ourselves the next point is asking if author has deliberately left out undermined overlooked something in favor of something else so say for example author is presenting an argument and cites several examples so the question is has the author cited only those which support the theory and has left out many obvious example studies which actually support the opposite uh, of the theory then we also ask what is the kind of line of argument the author is developing is it rational moral or emotional appeal recall we analyzed the text in the previous class using the framework developed by university of toronto writing center there are mainly three kinds of questions in that framework analysis asks interpretation asks and evaluation asks so what is of concern to us at the moment is the third one that is evaluation ask so what does it mean how well does the text do what it does what is its value so that's what we are going to check so specifically these are some questions we will be asking when we are critically reading a text and assessing its value how does it contribute to the discipline are its main conclusions original or is it just reiterating what has already been very well established then does the evidence and reasoning adequately support the theory and theories presented so if there is an argument has it been developed very well have there been 
sufficient evidence to support it. Are the sources reliable? If the author has cited somebody, has referred to somebody, are these reliable? Are the people who are cited are experts? So, these are the questions we ask. Is the argument logically consistent? Is it convincing? We have to check whether the argument is logical and consistent and it is convincing to readers. We will see in a very soon with the help of an example, how an argument can have flaws. Then, were the tools designed and executed in accordance with the accepted standards of the relevant discipline? So, if the author is reporting an experimental study, has developed some tools to collect data and then has used some specific frameworks to analyze the data and come to conclusion. The question we ask is, has it been done properly according to the standards established in that particular discipline. For example, say I am looking at how a particular teaching method can be effective in developing reading skills among primary level students. So, I choose a sample group. Now, I need to be careful about how I choose this sample group. This has to consist of learners from different backgrounds, from rural context, from urban context, from houses where there is exposure to English and from places where there is no English in the surroundings then from different tiers of economic backgrounds and then also gender. So, it means some number of boys, some number of girls. So, all these things I need to keep in mind when I am choosing a sample group for my study. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the theory? If I am supporting a theory or I am putting forward a new theory, the questions are what are the strengths of this or what are the possible weaknesses? Has the author thought about the possible limitations and has he or she addressed those concerns? How would competing theories criticize this text? How could the author reply? This is again very important. So, I propose a theory. So, I also need to foresee what others might criticize this and so I need to be ready with some explanations, some answers to the queries. Overall, is the theory approach in this text better than competing theories approaches? In other words, what are its comparative strengths and weaknesses? Note here that it is impossible to develop the perfect theory is bound to have its own limitations. So, what we need to have in mind is the theory should have as few limitations as possible and it should have generalizability in the sense we should be able to apply it to as diverse contexts as possible. Okay. So, moving on. So, reading critically basically means the questions we just went through, when you ask these questions, it basically what we do there is reading between the lines. 
So, you have sentences before you in a text, you read them and then you understand them. So, that is one level. So, what do you do when you read between the lines? Some of the things we do when we are critically reading a text are one identifying author's position on the issue. If it is an argumentative text, it is very important to first identify the author's position. Has the author been in favor of something or is he against or is the author taking a somewhat balanced nuanced kind of position. Then deciphering author's attitude towards the topic. So, is the author kind of positive towards the topic or is very he or she is very critical about it. Uh, there is a kind of condescending attitude. So, what is it? Understanding the tone of the passage. So, this is in relation to author's attitude towards the topic. Then um, use of vocabulary and sentence strategies. So, these are also very crucial. The words the author has chosen, the kind of uh, structures the author has chosen to talk about something are very important. Because note here that there is no exact replica of putting thoughts into words. There is just no direct correspondence between thoughts and words. So, the words we choose, the sentences we choose, they are not neutral. They come with them some kind of attitude. They indicate kind of uh, attitude towards the topic. So, we will look at uh, examples, then this becomes clear. For example, the use of modifiers. Look at the sentences uh, um, given here. Sales rose dramatically when she was the chairperson. I have highlighted the modifier dramatically here. Second sentence, sales rose significantly when she was the chairperson. The only difference between these two sentences is the modifier. So, does it bring any change? Does it tell us something more about the topic? So, when you see the word dramatically, what does it indicate? It usually indicates something very drastic, something of high proportions, very high rate. Significantly also tells something you know which was done in large proportions of course, but there is a slight difference between dramatically and significantly. So, dramatically you can say is one level up. So, by choosing the word dramatically here the author is focusing more on the achievements of a lady um, when she was the chairperson. So, these subtle changes we need to be very aware of when we are reading something critically. Second choice of uh, vocabulary, note here that sometimes synonyms are available. To, it means you have many words to choose to talk about the same thing. And these synonyms have we usually say similar meaning, but not the same meaning. So, the choice you make matters. Let us look at these examples. These are taken from popular newspapers and magazines. 
five reasons why Manchester City cannot emulate the Arsenal Invincibles this season. Did Kim Kardashian copy Demi Lovato's Halloween costume? Fans are calling the star out. Baidu's new system can learn to imitate every accent. Now, look at the words in bold, emulate, copy, imitate. They are synonyms and they have similar meaning, but are they same? Definitely not. There are subtle differences among these words. When you look at the word emulate, this also means copy something or copy somebody, but the word emulate always has a positive connotation. So, you have an ideal person, an ideal organization and you want to behave just like that ideal you have. So, here this is a positive connotation. In the second sentence, copy here has been used in the negative connotation. So, here this is something undesirable. So, look at the stark contrast between emulate and copy here. The third sentence, imitate, this has been used in the context of artificial intelligence and therefore, here it takes a different sense altogether. Probably using the word copy here would sound inappropriate. So, the choice of word very clearly matters a lot. Moving on, the next thing is hedging. Hedging means you use words to tone down what you are saying, to modify what you are saying. Let us look at examples. Viewing a movie in which alcohol is portrayed appears to lead to higher total alcohol consumption of young people while watching the movie. So, imagine you have conducted a study about alcohol portrayal in movies and how this affects young people and their alcohol consumption. So, if you are reaching a conclusion as the author has done here, the author has used a hedging word appears. So, now you can read the same sentence without this and then see. Viewing a movie in which alcohol is portrayed leads to higher total alcohol consumption. So, the level of confidence is high there. By using the word appears, the author has toned down the statement. Because the author wants to be cautious, there may be some other studies which contradict this claim. So, therefore, it is better to be cautious. Now, look at the second one. Do we have a hedging device here? Furthermore, this proves that humans are wired to imitate. The word proves here is very strong. So, this is a kind of very strong conclusion, a very strong statement. So, by using a hedging word and by not using a hedging word, the authors take a position about the claims, about the strength of the claims they are making. So, when you are reading something critically, you need to watch out for these hedging devices. Then sentence strategies. I am going to look at only two sub parts under this. First one is 
using active or passive voice. Most often we have been told that you can convert any active into passive voice and there are rules to follow and so on. But if you look at the use of passive voice in real life context, you will see that there is always some purpose behind it. For example, let us look at this sentence from a newspaper. White House says 25,000 dollars check has been sent to fallen soldier father. This part you can see that this is in passive. So, why passive? There is a purpose. This sentence appeared in a context where there was controversy about a fallen soldier and compensation given to the family by the government. Then the government issues a clarification. So, there comes this structure. So, by using passive, the agent is purposefully hidden. Who has sent? So, that point is purposefully here not given. So, by using passive voice, you are clearly saying something. Secondly, backgrounding or foregrounding. Let us look at these two sentences. They are about the same topic. Even when her mother was ill and father was away, Mary did not lose courage. So, now we rephrase it, Mary did not lose courage even when her mother was ill and father was away. So, do you see any difference between these two sentences? Both of these are complex sentences of course, um, both have a subordinate clause and an independent clause, but there is difference in the order. Here subordinate clause appears first and then independent clause comes. In this example, Mary did not lose courage, so the independent clause comes first and then the subordinate clause comes. But by starting with subordinate clause and by supplying some details, the author here seems to withhold the main information which is presented in the independent clause. By delaying it, the author may be trying to create some kind of suspense and thereby giving more importance to what Mary did here. But that effect you will not see in this example, because the main information is given away in the very beginning itself. So, there are many such uh, sentence uh, strategies. So, these tell us about author's attitude towards something, at the kind of importance the author gives to the topic and so on. Now, we will look at movie reviews, two movie reviews about the same movie and then we will try to understand how author's or attitude is different and how it is reflected in the use of language. So, let us read the first one. Sure. Nitish Tiwari's Bollywood crowd pleaser Dangal follows a formula. Father abandons his dream of being an international wrestling champion. Father hopes for a son who will live out his dream for him. Father ends up with four daughters. 
Father discovers that two of his daughters are dexterous brawlers. Father declares from now on they will only wrestle. Father trains those daughters in defiance of the villagers to tooting and assumptions about women's roles, to mud wrestle and instills them a spirit of feminism. This is the second review. In the story department, Dangal offers few surprises because Gita and Babita's historic wins at the Commonwealth Games and following championships are common knowledge. However, this screen adaptation serves as a recap of their arduous journey and it vigorously recaptures their stubborn father's resolve to make them professional wrestlers against the odds. Since it encapsulates the historic wins of the Fogarts who brought India glory, the film is also bound to inspire more women to seriously consider Kushti as a sport. Okay. Now, let us look at these reviews in detail. So, the first review, let us look at it in detail. Sure, Nitish Tiwari's Bollywood crowd pleaser Dangal follows a formula. The, the word here is crowd pleaser. So, this has a negative connotation. Then um, let us look at the sentence uh, structure. Father abandons his dream. So, starts with father, then father hopes for a son. So, this starts with father. Father ends up with four daughters. Again, the, the sentence starts with father. Father discovers that two of his daughters. This sentence again starts with the word father. Again, father declares from now on they will only wrestle. So, this again starts with the word father. The, this sentence also starts with the word father. So, father trains those daughters and so on. So, what does this mean? Does it tell us something about the author's attitude towards the topic that is the movie here? If you come to the end of the review, this is only an extract. So, here you can see that the keyword is instill. So, it was not there something earlier and it is the father who instills. So, what does he instill? A spirit of feminism. So, so this is again a very strong word. So, um, use of words like instill, crowd pleaser and then these sentences which all start with father. So, they clearly put father in focus. So, these things very clearly tell us that the writer of this reviewer is not happy with the movie. The attitude is not positive. The writer thinks this is oh, this movie is only a crowd placer and contrary to what some people said, he says, the writer of this review says, the father instills in a, them a spirit of feminism. So, this is not kind of a movie which celebrates feminism as well. So, this definitely has negative opinion about the movie here. Now, the second review, it starts with this sentence, in the story department, Dangal offers few surprises. 
So, not few has negative connotation. So, um, here the writer of this review admits story wise there are no surprises, but then is it a bad movie? No. Look at the linker here, however, so contrast. So, this screen adaptation serves as a recap of their arduous journey, key word here is arduous, the adjective and then it vigorously recaptures the adverb vigorously, stubborn father. So, again look at the adjective stubborn to make them professional wrestlers against the odds. So, all these adjectives and adverbs, they clearly lay emphasis on hard efforts put by father. So, the contrasting linker and the choice of vocabulary clearly tries to highlight the plus points of the movie. So, maybe story wise there are not surprises, but see there are lot of other things the movie has to offer. Going on, since it encapsulates again the key word here is encapsulates the historic, so adjective historic. So, all these clearly indicate a very strong positive attitude of the writer towards the topic here. The mo this movie review just does not stop at commenting on the movie, this goes even a step further. So, if you look at the last two lines, the film is also bound to inspire more women to seriously consider Kushti as a sport. So, the writer here he seems to be very confident that this movie is very inspiring and it will have effect on uh, uh, personal lives as well. And then the, you can also see that there are several other differences. In the first one, the only proper name you find is director Nitish Tiwari. This does not talk about Fogart sisters or the actors who played them. So, there is a sort of you know impersonal attitude kind of distancing uh, from the topic that kind of attitude you can clearly see here. Whereas, here you see names Gita, Babita, then Commonwealth Games. This is because here this is trying to get in close association with the audience, with the readers. This is a kind of an attempt to make the topic sound familiar. So, these two reviews very clearly have two very starkly opposite opinion viewpoint on the same movie. Now, so which one you trust, which one you believe in more? This one appeared in a foreign newspaper, whereas the second one appeared in an Indian newspaper. So, does that matter? Some people might say that because the first review appeared in a foreign newspaper where Hindi movies popularly known as Bollywood usually does not command great respect. Bollywood is usually considered as only songs and dance. So, some people may say that the writer of this review already has lot of preconceptions and is biased against Bollywood movies. So, 
the writer here treats this particular movie also on par with other movies. So, does not bring in fresh look. So, this is what some people may argue. In contrast, this is from the Indian context and hence personalization and hence it is closer to you can say heart. But again some people may say uh, because this the second review is from Indian context this might be biased. So, there are these kinds of many um, viewpoints and so if you as a reader if you want to take a clear position it is always better to read such reviews in detail also consult some other say sources say another newspaper or you other things and then you make your final decision. So, when it comes to a movie review it is rather very easy to identify author's attitude uh, to identify flaws in it and then decide whether as a whole you are going to believe in what the uh, uh, writer is saying or not. But this is not always very easy. Sometimes arguments are complex and you really need to read very carefully to see if the argument is strong. We will now look at a sample and a very short argument and then see if it is convincing or not. This extract is taken from ets.org. This is kind of um, an argument task which would appear in GRE. So, let us look at this argument in detail. In surveys, Mason city residents rank water sports, swimming, boating and fishing among their favorite recreational activities. The Mason river flowing through the city is rarely used for these pursuits. However, and the city park department devotes little of its budget to maintaining riverside recreational facilities. For years, there have been complaints from residents about the quality of the river's water and the river's smell. In response, the state has recently announced plans to clean up Mason River. Use of the river for water sports is therefore sure to increase. The city government should for that reason devote more money in this year's budget to riverside recreational facilities. So, are you now happy with this argument? So, now let us first identify the main argument. The main argument is that residents have complained about the quality of rivers water and in response there is a plan to clean it. So, as a result use of the river for water sports is going to increase. So, the government has to spend more money to create recreational facilities. So, this is the argument. So, the first point is city residents rate water sports very high in surveys. Then as I mentioned the state is going to clean river water and this will lead to an increase in water sports. Therefore, the government should devote more money for riverside recreational facilities. So, this is the argument. So, you can see these two are premises and this is the conclusion of the argument here. Now, 
the question is so is it logical is it convincing is it a good argument we need to look at each of these premises very carefully and then see if these actually hold good so now coming to the first point about city residents rating water sports high in surveys so that is the first question we ask ourselves so what was this survey about what was the population in the sense how many people took this survey was it a representative sample and what kind of questions were asked in the survey so all these details are very important without those details it is very difficult to believe in the findings of the survey here the text only says this in surveys residents rank it high and it does not give any further details about the surveys conducted who conducted them for instance so all these factors are very important so uh, since those details are missing this is not a strong point okay the second one is connection between the status of river and increase or decrease in the use of river for sports so the text says this river you know the quality of the river's water has been very bad it the river has a foul smell and um, in response the state has announced to clean up and then it assumes the use of the river for water sports is going to increase so this connection between the improved quality of the river say and then increase in uh, say water sports this connection is not very clearly established here okay and then there is also question about cleaning operation so here uh, the text mentions the state has recently announced plans to clean up mason rivers so this is still at the announcement level no further details about it are given and then there's no guarantee that this clean up operation will be successful so what if the quality of the river does not change so there is always that question so while you know when you look at this it sounds convincing okay so the use of the river is going to increase so therefore the government should spend more money on it because if more and more people come there for recreation so it will create more job opportunities so it will be uh, a good source of income for the government so if the government invests more money it will be more beneficial for both the government and the residents so that's how it appears when you look at it initially but after asking ourselves questions about these things then we understand that there are many loopholes in this argument so therefore it is very difficult to believe in this argument and support this kind of line of argument okay so now that we have looked at a short argument now let us look at a detailed text and then read it 
critically. This is the same text which we looked at in the previous class when we were discussing reading for detailed understanding. When we were doing uh, detailed reading of it, we analyzed the patterns, uh, we saw how each paragraph is connected with uh, one another and then what is the role of introductory paragraph and the concluding paragraph. So, uh, what is the significance of the title and many other things we asked ourselves. Now, when we are reading it uh, text critically, we ask questions about the validity of the examples and the strength of the argument. So, let us start. So, we know the title is how weather has changed world history. So, the title has the word change. Let us look at synonyms like um, influence, affect, alter, why uh, the writer has not used any of the other synonyms. So, for example, if the writer had used influence, so would it be something different, how weather has influenced world history. So, you can say that influence is a level lower, when you say change, the, the effect is stronger and long lasting, but when you use influence, the, it is actually a level low. So, the word change here clearly indicates that the author is quite um, confident about the claim uh, he or she is making here. Okay. Um, so, we look at the first paragraph, it is tempting and often comforting to think that humans control their fates. The decisions that people make in their daily lives can affect many things and the course of their lives cumulatively reflects these many small decisions. On the other hand, people cannot control every aspect of their environments and forces beyond human control frequently intervene in human affairs. Notwithstanding many people's opinion that the weather has little influence in their lives besides determining what clothes they wear on a particular day, the weather has in fact caused world history to radically shift in important ways that are still felt today. So, what is the author's position here? Author's position is very clear that the weather has caused world history to radically shift in important ways that are still felt today. So, the key words are here, radically shift felt even today. So, this tells us something about the writer's conviction. So, the writer believes the effect has been very significant. So, uh, there have been radical shifts in the world history because of weather and those shifts are important even now, they are relevant even now. So, these claims we now have to see if the author presents enough evidence to support these uh, points. Okay. The next paragraph, numerous examples from world history document the long term effects of weather in the formation of cultures and nations. In the 13th century, Kubilai Khan ruled over the vast Mongol empire, which spanned from the Pacific Ocean in the east to the Black Sea in the west, from present day Siberia in the north to Afghanistan in the south. To expand his reign further, Kubilai Khan mounted two invasions of Japan. Two monsoons, however, caused him to end his attacks. Delgado 2008 describes legendary accounts of this event. 
The legend often repeated in countless history books speaks of gigantic ships numbering into the thousands, crewed by indomitable Mongol warriors and of casualties on a massive scale, with more than 100,000 lives lost in the final invasion attempt of 1281. Page 4. Because of this unexpected defeat, Kublai Khan decided to stage a third invasion of Japan, but he died before he could fulfill this ambition. Without these monsoons, Japan might have been defeated by the Mongols and thus lost its identity as a unique culture with far-reaching consequences for Asian and world history. So, this example is used to instantiate the two points. So, one the weather has affected and that is still relevant. So, um, Kublai Khan's invasion failed because of a weather phenomena, otherwise the um, culture and other things uh, would have been very different here. So, that is the claim. So, the key word here is numerous, numerous uh, actually too many, a lot of. So, this is again a very strong word. So, the question is, is the example cited here valid? Do other records support this? So, this incident about Kublai Khan and his failed invasions. If you do a bit of uh, research, you will find some other uh, sources which talk about uh, Kublai Khan and his invasion of Japan. One such is, Japan's kamikaze events, the stuff of legend may have been real, which appears on nationalgeographic.com. Uh, so, this article actually talks about typhoons being one of the reasons for the failure of Kublai Khan, but at the same time, the article also talks about several other factors like resistance of Japanese troops, which could have also caused this de defeat of Kublai Khan. And then the article also uh, uh, talks about this very interesting thing that uh, there is this legend, in, in very popular legend um, about this particular incident that God sent uh, these powerful winds to save Japan and they are called uh, kamikaze. The article refers to a study which says this legend actually may have been invented during World War II to boost the morale of Japanese soldiers. So, this article in short brings in new insights on this topic. So, as this text claims, weather alone could not have been the sole deciding factor here. So, uh, there are several, there could have been several other factors. Okay, moving on. In the early years of America's Revolutionary War, which began in 1775, it appeared likely that the British would crush the armies of a colonial territory and incorporate it back into the empire. The British troops were a well-trained and disciplined army that was feared worldwide. In contrast, the American troops were poorly organized and lacked sufficient resources to fight effectively. General George Washington could have easily been defeated in the Battle of Long Island on August 22, 1776. Historical records show that Sir William Howe, the British commander, was clearly defeating Washington on Long Island and was actually winning handily, Seymour 1995. Nonetheless, the weather intervened when a heavy fog rolled in, so the American forces were able to retreat, regroup and survive to fight another day. 
because of this fog, the United States was not defeated in its struggle for freedom. Consequently, today's United Kingdom of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland does not include the United States. The United States is not a commonwealth of a mother country as Canada and Australia are, though the United States still has strong ties to its colonial past. So, this talks about the weather phenomena of fog and how if it had not been there, the present day situation would have been very different. So, now again the question is the example cited here valid, do other records support this? So, if you check for example, this article called Battle of Long Island from Encyclopedia Britannica, this talks about several other fa factors like uh, untrained US troops and they are suffering huge loss. And actually Howey, the military, uh, the com British commander actually pausing to prepare for final assault and not because of the fog. So, the, according to this article actually the US troops suffered huge losses. So, in fact, you can say they lost it, but this particular paragraph claims that it was in favor of the US troops. Let us look at this particularly um, these important words. Uh, American forces were able to retreat, regroup and survive to fight another day. So, the choice of words is very important. You can say American forces lost, but here the, the words are were able to retreat, regroup and survive. We move on. When Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Russia in the early 19th century, he met with early successes that appear to guarantee that he might eventually rule the world as his personal domain. His soldiers captured Moscow and destroyed the city which encouraged him to push farther in his military campaigns. However, because of his dreams of glory, Napoleon overlooked the simple fact that Russian winters are extremely cold. When the temperatures fell below freezing, many of his soldiers and their horses died in the brutal weather. As Belloc 1926 writes in his classic study of the Napoleonic Wars, the cold was the abominable thing, the dreadful enemy against which men could not fight and which destroyed them, page 217. As a result of the failure of Napoleon's Russian campaigns, his own rule ended relatively soon after. His defeat led to a reorganization of power throughout the European nations as well as to the rise of Russia as a major world power. So, the weather phenomena here is the cold and if it had not been there, how Europe would have been different. Now, is the example cited here valid? Were there other significant causes? Say for example, if you check this article, Napoleon's failure for the want of a winter horse shoe, which appears on the BBC website, you can find there several other reasons being listed, the most important being logistics failure. The article claims that Napoleon simply failed in handling and moving the troops and as claimed uh, the, uh, that the cold was the biggest enemy, this article says that Napoleon's soldiers were actually very well trained and they could withstand cold. So, cold was not a problem at all. So, this is a very different viewpoint. And then there is another article which appears on uh, slate.com which says typhus infection spread by lice was also a very significant factor in the defeat of Napoleonic forces. So, as this claims cold alone could not have been the uh, sole factor. So, looking at this text and the examples, now we can say that all these examples are related to war. So, could it have been better if the text was about how weather has affected the war? So, these are the questions we ask when we read something critically. Thank you.